I'm going to hand over to you um, for the time being, Megan, and thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Martin and everyone, for having me. And, um, you know, a huge credit to the Chamber for the work that you've done to get all of those new members. I think people are certainly looking for um, a sort of one-stop shop when it comes to advice. And there's so many different initiatives from all levels of government out there. So a big congratulations to all of the leadership there. Um, as most of you um, will know, um, Queensland acted pretty early when it comes to uh, when it came to the response to COVID-19, we were the first state in the country to declare a state of emergency on the 29th of January. Um, you know, I'd like to think that we were um, we were starting to head in a good direction on the Gold Coast uh, prior to COVID-19. You know, the ABS data for March showed more than 250,000 jobs had been created uh, in Queensland, but no doubt this pandemic has had a huge impact on businesses and um, the situation we're looking at today is very, very different to what we were looking at months ago and um, you know the ABS data set released this week I think shows the huge economic impact we're seeing. Um, uh, in one positive way I suppose you can look at the difference between states. Queensland is not has not been hit as hard as some other states and I think that's partly been due to some of the government responses. Um, many of you will know that on the 18th of February we uh, were the first government to announce a relief package. Uh, then on the 24th of uh, March we announced the single largest relief package by any state government at that time. So that included $1.2 billion uh, for a health system, but then $3 billion uh, to support jobs and businesses. And um, I've got some information here that I might just briefly touch on around some of those initiatives because I think some of them, some of them can be overlooked and um, others other people might not know about. So most of you will know about all of the payroll tax relief initiatives that have been put in place. Uh, that's a $950 million relief package. So for small and medium sized businesses that have annual payrolls of $6.5 million uh, or less, they're eligible for a two month uh, refund and uh, a three month payroll tax holiday. For large businesses, uh, they're eligible for a two month payroll tax refund and to have their deferral extended to uh, all of uh, 2020. So effectively, no Queensland business impacted by COVID-19 will have to make a payroll tax payment this year. And I've um, received some data around what that meant for the Gold Coast today. So we've handed back more than $28 million to over 1,040 businesses on the Gold Coast. So uh, hopefully that support will be helping people keep afloat. Uh, we also have our job support loans, which many of you will know QRider has um, shut down in terms of new applications. Um, that is a $500 million loan facility of up to $250,000. Uh, it's a 10 year loan um, capacity, but the first year is interest free. Uh, and again, uh, I've got some Gold Coast data and um, as of last night, there were 263 businesses approved totaling over $37 million. Uh, so I think that will certainly be helpful for a lot of businesses. And I know the feedback I've received from a lot of people has been waiting for that JobKeeper payment. That, ca that, that cash flow was really critical for people. Um, we also announced a $500 million worker assistance package. So uh, some of that uh, detailed of the funding has been announced. Uh, you will have seen, I think it was last week, um, Minister Fentiman uh, announced uh, that we have established a Jobs Finder Queensland web portal. So that's connecting uh, workers uh, who, with businesses where we know there might be uh, an increase in demand. Uh, and there's also uh, access to um, free TAFE courses. And uh, that is uh, also eligible to some small businesses who might be wanting to get some micro credentials while they're going into that hibernation period. Um, also, um, many of you will see the, um, the decision around uh, National Cabinet around the moratorium on evictions, both for residential tenants and, um, and commercial tenants. Um, and um, uh, that uh, framework obviously was done at a federal level for that commercial piece. But since then, we've uh, committed $400 million to support landlords and tenants um, impacted by COVID-19 uh, by providing land tax relief. So eligible land owners can apply for up to a three-month waiver and three-month uh, deferral of tax. Uh, that is on the condition though that it is passed on to the tenant and I know that's a lot of small businesses I've spoken to that's been one of their biggest concerns is keeping up with the rent when their revenue stream has uh, reduced so hopefully that will help. Um, we also have a industry support package. So that's a $1 billion industry support package to assist large businesses through the period to ensure that they uh, can scale up 
and service the community when economic activity improves. And um, we obviously have a lot of large businesses on the Gold Coast, particularly in the tourism industry, that I think uh, certainly, uh, you know, we want to make sure they uh, can remain viable in the long term. Um, some other um, initiatives include the $100 million electricity uh, bill relief package. So that's uh, for businesses, $500 rebate on power bills of sole traders and small and medium businesses who consume less than 100,000 kilowatt hours for individuals. It's $200 straight off your household bill. Um, we've also appointed um, in Parliament, actually, now I can't remember whether it was yesterday or the day before that, my days are merging together, um, the appointment of a Queensland Small Business Commissioner until the end of 2020 to give small businesses a single point of contact for leasing disputes during the recovery um, from the impact of COVID-19. And I know in Victoria, uh, their Small Business Commissioner prior to COVID-19 I can't remember the numbers now, but they were receiving a huge amount of calls and 40% of those prior to COVID-19 were rel relating to um, uh, you know, commercial leasing arrangements. So you can imagine uh, how much that's going to increase now. So I think that was a really important move uh, that we've been able to provide. Uh, we've also beefed up our small business hotline just to provide more advice uh, to small businesses. Um, uh, we've provided uh, the CCRQ with $360,000 to run proactive outreach to small businesses and expand the capacity of their call centre. Uh, and we've also, uh, we're also trying to assist manufacturers or businesses who are having difficulties accessing supplies um, uh, with a new portal to help identify, match and manage supply chain shortages. So I know on the Gold Coast, Grandad Jacks, I actually went to school with one of the, um, uh, one of the sons who uh, I think managers there. Um, they've been working with the Queensland government, uh, a lot of really fantastic businesses innovating and looking at ways in which uh, uh, you can support um, not only the government but the community uh, in areas around PPE. Um, so that's been really good to see um, some businesses, you know, being able to at least continue operation and diversify. Um, so that just gives you a bit of a summary and yeah, really just wanted to say I am um, I feel the pain everyone is feeling at the moment. My family owned a small business in Narang for a period of time. And I know, um, you know, this is an incredibly tough time for not only staff, but also businesses. And um, if there's any support that I can provide, always here to listen. And I know our Minister for Small Business, Shannon Fetterman, is um, always uh, available to talk and willing to hear uh, from any businesses and how we can, how we can make this process as easy as possible. So thank you very much and yeah, happy to take Thanks, questions. Thanks, uh, Megan. Yeah, we've got some, some questions coming in. I might, I might kick off and give everyone a chance to, to type their questions in. Um, but with your um, assistant ministerial hat on, how does the tourism recovery look like on the Gold Coast from your perspective? I know it's a bit of a crystal ball um, question, but it'd be interesting to, to see, hear your vision. Yeah, look, um, I've had a couple of conversations now with Annalise Batista, who's obviously our, um, uh, who's obviously um, heading up um, Destination Gold Coast. And uh, look, um, you know, uh, the, one of the first relief packages we provided was trying to assist uh, uh, some tourism industry operators. I know, particularly some who are operating on government land, in terms of um, waiving some of those leasing requirements, but. Um, uh, at the moment, I suppose our immediate focus is just getting people through this period, so getting people through the hibernation. Uh, but no doubt, we then need to focus on the economic recovery piece, and that's something that we're all working on behind the scenes. Um, I think I think uh, it was the National Minister who came out and said, look, the reality is, is that international tourism is going to take some time before we can even tap into that market, unfortunately. And I know that's where a lot of our operators were uh, focusing on. And um, uh, so we obviously will be focusing mostly on domestic tour uh, tourism uh, straight after, um, straight after uh, the COVID-19 restrictions are lifted. Um, but at the moment, it's, I think it's a matter of preparing but not uh, expecting a date because we don't know at this stage when that end date will be. So it would be premature for me to be able to announce anything, but certainly um, open to any ideas that people might have. Sure. Okay, thank you. Um, we we'll jump to one here. I think you partially opened the first one. Um, just from uh, your local office, what are the most common requests from business operators that, that you're getting um, currently? Um, a lot of business operators early on were, well, 
So early on, a lot of business operators were incredibly concerned around uh, the restrictions and the inability for them to retain staff. So, so many people were just having to let go of staff. And so we, um, as a Queensland government union movement, and I think all biz, you know, the business uh, groups and lobbies fought hard for the job keeper payment. And I've got to say, I think that's been really well received by everyone. Um, the, since then, I think the, um, the, feedback we're getting from people is just some concern around that five week period and when people didn't have necessary people may have already had a slight downturn in January or not a downturn necessarily but that wasn't their highest um, highest revenue rating period um, they just don't have that cash flow to even uh, survive for that five week period so I think that's where our job support loan has been helpful and of course the federal government also has loans um, but I do acknowledge that's incredibly difficult for some businesses and that's probably been the, the biggest feedback we've received from people today. Okay, thank you. Um, another one from one of our, our board members. Can you clarify if it has been determined if JobKeepers is being counted as part of the payroll and payroll tax? Um, in some cases it pushes obviously companies above that threshold and, and can be counterproductive. So. Yeah, yeah. And look, I know this is something that's been floated. Um, obviously, JobKeeper payment is a federal government initiative and the federal government have also determined that it's a taxable allowance. Um, we're looking at this in two sort of two primary ways um, in terms of how employers might use this. One would be that uh, it's used to supplement wages uh, and the other is that it's effectively being used to entirely replace wages. So. Um, acting as a, a welfare payment as such. So um, we've said that we'd be willing to consider taxation treatment in, in that regard, um, but obviously we'll still need to work through that with business and industry okay. and the federal government. So. Yeah, of course, of course. All right, um, probably a, a statement and maybe a question out of it. A lot of businesses can't fund or are willing to fund the first month of JobKeeper. So a lot of, of long-term casuals are not being reinstated for the JobKeeper payment. So that's a statement from one of our members but again it refers back to that that initial um, bit of heartache I suppose the, the, the five weeks before stuff starts kicking in I know the bulletin were keen to have some comments on that yesterday but it's um, you know, a short-term pain I guess yeah, and look, I've got to say, I should actually also flag, one of the other things I've had from businesses is um, casuals who, so I've got, for example, one business I spoke to in Narang, a coffee shop owner, um, who's only started their business about a year ago, well, yeah, it would be just over 12 months ago. And so that first year, their turnover was actually quite low because they were new. And so their job keeper, like, they can't, they're not actually eligible to apply fire for JobKeeper um, right now because their turnover technically has actually increased but they're still not really operating in a way in which you'd want to be as a business and they've employed extra people and so they've had to lay all of them off and they're not eligible for JobKeeper so there are still some flaws in the system I feel for a lot of casuals and staff who have casuals who um, uh, who may have been working for multiple different businesses and not for that 12 month period and particularly visa holders who aren't eligible for uh, JobKeeper if they don't fall within that bracket uh, and then also not job seeker and the reality is is that um, no one is coming to Australia at the moment so I think some of these things um, in my view should be looked at. Sure sure um, last week um, as you know we're, we're affiliated as every chamber is with, with CCIQ at a state level so uh, Minister Fentiman held a, um, a Q&A, uh, which Laura Younger um, represented the chamber there. There was talk about um, available um, uh, available funding and also the, uh, the talk which has been announced about the Small Business Commissioner. So um, there was um, talk of uh, funding being allocated to CCIQ from the state um, in that regard to support small businesses. And I suppose is there a conduit there where the chambers on the ground, obviously our relationship with is with our local businesses. Is there any um, thoughts or can you elaborate more on the plans for uh, funneling that money, I suppose, and the support we can expect as a chamber at a local level? Uh, to the CCIQ, do you mean? Yeah. In terms of that? Yeah. Look, I, I'm personally not aware of how that funding agreement um, looks, so I'd have to find out some more information. But I take your point, like, you know, um, I think this is the case for any organisations when you have a key peak body that represents Queensland or Australia and you've got subsidiary bodies underneath that that represent regions, you want to know how that's going to impact the Gold Coast. So I can follow that up. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I think we might know the answer to, to this question. There's obviously been a bit of spruik. So in regards to a very direct question, are the loans that you talked about um, 
still available or there's a, a temporary um, stoppage, but is that a short-term, long-term position? Uh, look, my understanding is that they have closed um, for now. I um, I know some people would like them reopened. Um, I can, you know, I can certainly put forward the case to the minister that, that some of the concerns people have, like any fund. Um, and look, I don't know the numbers of how many applicants there have been versus um, versus the amount of money there is. Um, but mo you know, most schemes realistically are oversubscribed. So. Um, but I do, I do acknowledge that some people were working up some applications, so um, it's something that I can pass through. Um, I should say, though, despite the fact that it has closed, if you still haven't received uh, feedback from Curida, they still are. There still are applications that they're assessing. There's still money left. They're just going through that um, that that detail. So, but yes, I'm certainly happy to feedback to, to the minister that um, I, I do know some people haven't been able to apply. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's another question here. Uh, can you use March or April or even April to June projected income to pass the alternative test for JobKeeper for a 30% plus drop in turnover? Look, that's a that's all managed by the federal government. So um, I am unaware of the detail of that application process. I'm sorry, I understand Angie Bell's coming on soon, so she might be able to answer that question. Um, I, I so from just speaking to a business i know they were looking at um they were waiting for april to then look um at whether they could apply so my understanding is there is some flexibility but I, yeah don't quote me on that it's not my it's not my area of government okay sorry. Martin, could I, sorry laura here could i just comment on that because i was inquiring uh whether you could apply after april my understanding is that it is still available to be applied after april but if you if you want to get the payments for May, you have to apply prior to the end of April. Does that make sense? Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, just a quick question. We've heard, obviously, there's um, there's this common um, discussion, I think, agreement that there, everyone needs to feel a bit of the pain during this time, you know, before different grants become available, funding actually reaches bank accounts. Um, there is some some feedback and some, some um, chatter in the background on the Gold Coast that landlords aren't necessarily playing the game as, as well as they could, particularly at a commercial level. So um, how's that being policed? Um, what, what can we expect? What's sort of the messaging that, that we should be sending out to our businesses? Yeah, look, and I've got to say, I've had some complaints from people um, who they're just, yeah, um, landlords are not playing ball at all. And um, uh, my concern is that they are going to apply for this uh, tax uh, tax rebate and not pass it on even though they are required to um, look it is it's slightly difficult in that some of it comes under the federal scheme some comes under the state uh, jurisdiction in terms of the moratorium itself um, it's certainly something I'm happy to pass on because we've had the same question in our office around how do you report someone and if they're not um, if they're not complying with these um, new requirements um, and I but Obviously, people will want a timely response on that as well. So happy to take feedback on that and get back to you again. I'm sorry, I don't have the detail on that on me. Oh, good, thank you. Um, you know, a bit of a, a left ball on this one, but um, do you have any updates on the urgent situation? That's another question from, from I don't know. I don't have any updates as such. Um, uh, obviously, many of you will know um, the state government have provided um, uh, the commitment of $200 million support to, on, with some conditions uh, for Virgin Australia to uh, keep their base headquarters in Queensland. Uh, it was, of course, uh, brought here uh, by a previous Queensland government, um, and I think it would be, you know, it would be extremely disastrous if we lost. Um, that airline not only for those direct jobs but also for the impact that that will have on the economy. I think Annalise Batista O'Rogan from, from um, a news article the other night said that 46% of travellers fly into the Gold Coast on Virgin uh, and it's worth around $1.3 billion to our economy. So uh, losing a second airline um, not only will directly impact all of those jobs that we have here in Queensland but it all when you have a, a, a one airline policy and a monopoly over an industry, we all know that prices uh, hike up, which means that people have less money in their pockets to spend in businesses. So, um, and it may actually um, 
you know, may actually mean that people don't come here to begin with if, if the prices are too high. So uh, we're continuing to, I think, um, speak with Virgin and of course the federal government, our view is that it needs to be a nationally led approach because while Queensland directly benefits from those on the ground jobs of the headquarters, every other state uh, and the country benefits from having a two airline system. So we think it shouldn't just be Queensland going it alone. So um, hopefully we get some support there as well. Sure, sure. Um, just a follow-up from the previous question, more of a, again, just some um, embellishment of that. Uh, one of our members um, says, under the state rules, residential landlords can't actually confirm if tenants are actually affected by a significant drop in income, but the tenant is uh, topping uh, income, topping paying the rent up and can't be evicted. So again, it's just to sort of further, um, I suppose, what transparency is there to actually validate the, the state yeah. of the financial hardship. So we've done a lot of work with the REIQ um, on this and um, uh, so we've said that um, and I look I don't think anyone thinks it's appropriate necessarily for um, any individual to sort of see people's individual bank you know bank statements. Um, we have said though that you know obviously some uh, piece of proof needs to be provided in those early discussions but that um, you know if uh, if the landlord and the tenant can't come to an agreement then they can go in sorry in residential settings they can go to the RTA and have that compulsory conciliation process and then the RTA will require looking at proof uh, of income and the finances of both parties because um, it might be the case, and I've heard this, that um, that a landlord might also have lost a whole lot of, you know, their income stream as well. So we acknowledge that, you know, it's not just tenants feeling the pain here. There are landlords that are feeling the pain too. And, and having that independent body to assess those finances, I think, is the right way to do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, just going back to the, the small business commissioner, which is obviously news we welcome as a, a chamber. Marie Adsted is a... a a good friend of our chamber and certainly to CCIQ. She's carrying on the, until that position is fully endorsed, I understand she's, she's carrying that mantle. Um, what can we expect as a chamber from, from this newly created role? Uh, well, look, the, um, the idea of it is that, that, um, that she is a one-stop shop to businesses to provide support. And I think the bulk of, as I said before, with the Victorian figures, I think the bulk of her work will be in relation to commercial, um, commercial disputes. Um, I will get some further information from the Minister. Obviously, that this is a very newly created role, so um, I'm not um, fully across the intricate workings of what her day-to-day -day operations will look like. Um, but definitely, um, we'll be touching base with both her and the Minister to find out sort of what that will mean from the Chambers, for the Chambers perspective on the Gold Coast, but also just individual businesses on the ground, how they can, how they can get support. Sure, it'd be great to uh, extend a, uh, an offer on our behalf to, to be part of one of these webinars because I think that would be, uh, be great. Um, yeah, yep. More of a, a generic question, I suppose, as we, as we think about getting towards the final questions. What have, what have you learned from this crisis? Um, I've learned the, um, the great power of all governments working together despite political differences. And I think um, that's a great takeaway for me of how, um, how frankly, it would be good for governments to work all, you know, all year round, regardless of a pandemic. And the other taking up, um, you know, is that I think it's been really nice to see um, people acknowledging that everyone is struggling. And so you'll, I'll talk to, you know, employees who will say, oh, you know, I'm really struggling, but I know my, you know, my owner is as well. And so, I don't know, just seeing um, the community minded, um, the community-minded aspect has been really nice to see that people acknowledge that everyone is struggling at the moment and we need to think of other people. No, absolutely. I think that's um, certainly a sentiment we've, we've seen and shared too. So listen, there's, there's no more questions that, that I have. Um, I just wanted to thank you. Um, we've got, as you said, Angie Bell next um, Friday and we also have an interim one with um, insurance, financial services and superannuation. And then we'll just keep building these out week by week. I think the, the mayor's going to come along too. Um, yeah, we're obviously lobbying as we always do on, on behalf of business and some uh, a, a big soapbox at the minute is the, the perceived lack of economic development um, from a, at a council level. I'm not going to ask you about that, but it's certainly something that we'll be, we'll be pushing because um, unlike other local authorities, we, we don't have a dedicated local um, economic development section of the council. So something I think could be the, the phoenix coming out of this situation. So I don't know what you, if you have any thoughts on that. 
Yeah, look, I haven't, in all honesty, I haven't had a conversation with the mayor since being elected. So um, I might take a look at that and find out what they're doing behind the scenes before I make any con comment. Um, but absolutely take your point that economic development is incredibly important, probably now more than ever. Cool. And finally, I think it's summarised well by questions. Is there anything you'd like businesses to, to do or what could businesses do to, to help the government more? Look, I think just um, uh, feeding any positive stories through, but also if you have any genuine concerns around any of the initiatives that are out there, all the way that they're operating, um, obviously go through all of those formal channels, but please feel free to flick me an email as well and I can escalate it with uh, the relevant mind minister. Um, sometimes, you know, the first time I'll hear about things will be in the paper or on the TV and we won't always be able to solve things. But, um, you know, having just that conversation beforehand might allow us to actually fix it before it gets a bigger get, becomes a bigger problem. Sure, sure. OK, listen, thank you again for your time. I, I appreciate that. And on, on behalf of my board and my members, uh, thank you. And I look forward to seeing you when whatever normal looks like after this, but it's probably going to be through webcams for a little while longer but um thanks for your time today and, and thank you everyone for, for joining us